Trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and forever to repair. I don't recall who first said this, but it seems valid. I mean, if you Google this quote, there are 61,400 results. Therefore, the underlying premise, it takes years to build trust, should be true. But it's not. In fact, people decide on your trustworthiness much more quickly. It doesn't take years, months, weeks, days, or even hours. It happens in seconds, even a tenth of a second. According to one Princeton University study, and I quote, judgments made after a tenth of a second exposure time correlated highly with judgments made in the absence of time constraints, suggesting that this exposure time was a sufficient amount for participants to form an impression. In addition to judgments about trustworthiness, judgments about attractiveness, likability, and competence also did not vary with more time. So there you have it. First impressions can be formed immediately and are hard to change, even with the benefit of more time. So what does that say about us as people? Are we really so superficial that we make snap judgments so quickly? And just how do we form these impressions? Let's take a more specific example. Do you trust me? We've only just met. My name is Anthony, by the way. But by now you've certainly had enough time to form a first impression. Do you find me trustworthy? Honestly, why wouldn't you? I quote facts and figures from reputable sources. I wear glasses and I'm British for God's sake. I just look and sound smart, right? Plus I'm uh, attractive and humorous and so modest. Uh, all kidding aside, I'm somebody with whom you'd gladly share a cup of tea and perhaps a crumpet. Maybe you'd even take me home and introduce me to mother. Assuming I have gained your trust by now, what I'm about to say next it truly pains me. It's all a big fat lie. Well, not so much a lie as a mask. I actually don't need glasses. I just wear them to make me look more educated. And alas, I'm not British. My real name is Anthony, but uh, everybody calls me Tony, or Tone for short, and I'm from Brooklyn, not Britain. Hey, I'm sorry about lying to you guys, but if you met me as me, your first impression would not be Rhodes Scholar. You hear a Tony with this accent, you're more likely to assume Mafia than Mensa. Uh, Mensa is a club for really smart people whose IQs are in the 98th percentile, while Mafia is for, well, wise guys. Okay, I know what you're probably thinking. This guy is a liar. He tricked me with his posh clothes and his phony accent. So why am I still listening to him? Hey, you want to go? Go. Nobody's stopping you. But before you go judging me about masking my true identity, let me ask you this. Don't you do the same thing every day? Think about it. I bet you can't get through a single day, maybe not even a single waking hour, without trying on a mask of your own. Now, some masks are physical. Your clothes, hair, hat, glasses, makeup. But most masks are psychological. Your attitude, accent, manners, even your body language. Everybody uses masks to hide themselves. Well, maybe hide isn't the right word, but even placing yourself in a favorable light is a form of deception, if you think about it. And I'm not saying this is all bad. Sometimes it's better to tell a little white lie to spare somebody's feelings. And guys, you know what I'm talking about here. Your girlfriend says, does this dress make me look fat? Do you answer honestly? No, the dress doesn't make you look fat. You are fat. Of course not. You say, no, honey, you look great. Frankly, if we all went around saying exactly what we really thought, we'd be at each other's throats in no time. Civilization depends on a certain amount of civility. The only people who can get away with saying what they really think are very young children and very old people. With the elderly, it's called losing your filter. <laughs> My father lost his filter years ago. Now he swears like a sailor and says embarrassing things. But I gotta tell you, man, it is so refreshing to be around somebody who just says what he means and means what he says. He's a what-you-see-is-what-you-get kind of guy. No pretense, no subterfuge, and no filter. No mask at all. Uh, speaking of masks, did you know that in ancient Greek theater, the actors wore masks? It's true. It helped the audience see facial expressions, tell the characters apart, and leave no doubt as to whether they were seeing a comedy or a tragedy. 
Now, nowadays the actors don't wear actual masks, but the very act of acting involves trying on different persona. It's very strange, actually. Now, let's say you're going to a theater to see a play with a famous actor. My first Broadway play was Brighton Beach Memoirs, which is set in Brooklyn in 1937. It's uh, the story of Eugene Jerome, who's a 15-year-old boy writing his memoirs. Now, when I saw it in 1982, Matthew Broderick played Eugene. Now, this was before Ferris Bueller, but Matthew was a rising star. So when the play opens, my first thought is, there's Matthew Broderick, this is so cool. But after five minutes, I don't see Matthew anymore. I only see Eugene. And it's not 1982. Somehow I've been transported back in time to 1937. How does this happen? It's called the willing suspension of disbelief. Uh, the Oxford Dictionary defines this phenomenon as an intentional avoidance of critical thinking or logic and examining something surreal, such as a work of speculative fiction, in order to believe it for the sake of enjoyment. So get this, we willingly turn off our logical brains to enable ourselves to enjoy the illusion more. Aristotle explained that the audience accepts fiction as reality to experience a catharsis, a release of tensions to purify the soul. So to get the most out of theater, we gladly accept the actor's masks and allow ourselves to be taken in by the illusion. Fascinating. But why do we need masks to cope with reality? Is real life so disturbing that we can't face the facts? Maybe it really is like Colonel Jessup said in A Few Good Men. You can't handle the truth. Maybe we just prefer the fantasy. There's an old proverb, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But why do we always choose the tale over the truth? I have a theory about this. I blame Santa Claus. Yes, Santa Claus. You know the story. An old man rides in a sleigh pulled by flying reindeer, delivering toys made by elves to children all over the world. He somehow lands his sleigh on a pitched roof, slides his fat ass down a narrow chimney, delivers his gifts, shimmies back up the chimney, and repeats this over a billion times in one night. Now, when our parents first told us about Santa Claus, what did we think? Did we question them? No, we all wanted those toys so badly, we believed it. We bought the whole story, hook, line, and sinker. So my theory is once you believe in Santa Claus, you can let yourself believe in just about anything, if there's enough upside in it for you. Speaking of beliefs, uh, maybe that's why people get more religious with age. When you're young, you think you're going to live forever. But when you're staring mortality in the face, a little voice in hide, inside your head whispers, Hey, behind door number one is certain death. But you could trade it all in for what's behind door number two, which just might include eternal life. Do you select the cold, sober reality? Or do you choose what is in the hidden in the belief that it could be better? Is seeing believing? Or do you prefer thing to take things on faith and believe in the unseen? So at the end of the day, we all have our masks. We all have things to make us look better to others and feel better about ourselves. Sometimes we even shut off our brains and ignore harsh realities just to escape and indulge our fantasies, even when we know the truth. Sometimes we let ourselves willingly believe whatever gives us hope that maybe, just maybe, there's some light to overcome the darkness. Now, whether your hope comes from theater, religion, politics, fashion, whatever, that's up to you. But given our willingness to trust our first impressions and quickly suspend disbelief, I have a question for you. I started out our conversation by asking, do you trust me? But my final question to you is, when faced with the choice of a truth or the mask, do you trust yourself?